The landscape of video gaming is forever changing. Mobile gaming, a market that typically contains simplistic time wasters, now commands over 56% of the interactive media market share, with full-fledged console-equivalent games running on whatever current-gen iPhone is out. Games like Call of Duty, which were originally constructed to be political war machine criticisms alongside the flowing gunfight fests, now feature a code of conduct at the beginning, which is one of the most insulting things I think you could ever put into a game that's rated M for mature. Oh hey, when was the last time you ever put a quarter into a machine to play a game? No, you know what? When was the last time you ever used tokens to play a game? Every modern arcade that I can think of that still runs today either has day passes with free-to-play video games or taps little digital card readers that let you play more fucking phone games. Rest in peace, jingling child pocket gold in the shorts of every screaming 10-year-old at the local Chuck E. Cheese. May you now forever reign as a place for parents to host their regular drunken brawls and the kids to look around and gasp when they realize that Freddy Fosbear's Pizzeria is based off a real business. But for the most substantial evidence of how things have changed, just look at how ingrained in the background of life and civilization gaming has become. Come. You're watching me, an all-powerful stranger who's so intelligent that he could destroy an entire pumpkin using just his mind, rant about a piece of video game history. Now think for a minute, really take a second to think how many people are watching this video right now who don't care about gaming in general and are watching purely because I'm hilarious and amazingly insightful. It's probably a pretty decent number of people, and if you think the entire streaming industry is based around the games that profiteered it instead of the people playing them, I've got some very depressing esports revenue reports for you to read. Oh, and one last quick reminder on that idea. Remember forever that the most popular mechanic of Twitch.tv, which was a website originally made exclusively for video game streaming, is the Just Chatting tab, which has nothing to do with video games. 30 years ago, things weren't this ubiquitous. Oh sure, gaming did have mainstream pull. Nintendo, Sega, and whatever bullshit came loaded on the family computer was pretty much the forefront of what every normal, well-adjusted person thought of back when you mentioned the term video game. But to dive any deeper than the surface meant you actually had to indulge in a separate culture. These days, being a gamer is one of the most nondescript, say-nothing adjectives you can slap onto the majority of anyone under the age of 40. But back in in the 80s, 90s, and roughly until about 2007, describing a gamer meant just one thing in the eyes of mainstream media, marketing executives, and pop culture at large. A perpetually horny 19-year-old virgin male pot smoker who loves juvenile humor, violence, and being pushed to the brink of vomiting at all times. And that's it. No one else played video games according to the industry. Now the best example of that can be found by taking the same path everything popular takes in a free market economy. Follow the money. Advertisements for video games and their consoles used to be amazing. And I mean amazing. I'm not talking about through ingenuity or production value. I'm talking about the sheer level of balls that these guys had to really drill deep into their target audience of dumb high school boys. I spent a good number of hours combing through my resources of amusing old school video game magazine advertisements. Some of these I even specifically remember seeing as a kid in magazines. We're going to be looking at images that haven't left my brain in over a thousand years. To give you an idea of how off the fucking wall things are going to get, I want to share my categories with you. Now it's not every day that I whip out my fat throbbing categories for just anyone, so I'll I hope that when you see them, you'll want to have sex with them. As I gathered these images, I made the following folders on my computer to kind of loosely group the ads together for my script. Now, I'm not going to talk about them by category because a lot of them connect to each other in different fun ways, but this list is going to give you a good idea of what we're going to talk about in this video. Sex jokes, sex in general, racial stereotypes, 
gross outs, missing the mark entirely. I don't speak Japanese. Sega. Yeah, Sega will get its own entire folder and you'll see why. Also, Command & Conquer got its own folder. Actually awesome ads, and finally... <sighs> 9-11. Now, wait, 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 wait. The raunchiness is coming, trust me. But first, I have to talk about today's sponsor. And I hope you'll be okay with that and give them a moment of your time because let's be honest, this video is very, very likely going to be demonetized. Okay, take it away, more extreme version of me who's probably going to interrupt me right now. This video is sponsored by Raycon because nothing's more extreme than high quality earbuds. Raycon's everyday earbuds look, feel, and sound better than ever. They're optimized for perfect in-ear fit, offer eight hours of playtime, noise isolation and awareness mode, and even tap functions. I'm a ridiculously strong man, and I'm currently getting screwed over by January, as all the New Year's resolution slobs roll their way into the gym to take up my precious machines and racks. But I don't have to worry about their mouth breathing asses, because with my Raycons firmly in my ear canal, I can just activate noise isolation mode and focus on getting strong enough to pick up the sun, which is physically, geometrically, and mathematically impossible. Oh! And if at any point I need to pause my four hour long Eurobeat playlist in order to get a real good pump or something from the gym smoothie bar, I've just got to tap my Raycons twice and then say, uh, is there any way I could get get the avocado love it but without the added sugar oh it's already mixed in all right it's fine and that's because the newest raycon model has a huge list of tap controls and i have a sensitive tummy oh yeah click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash hugbees to get oh 15 percent or more off of your raycon purchase plus free shipping that's buyraycon.com slash hugbees for free shipping and 15 percent off your purchase or just click the link in the description raycon earbuds so good that they got me to work my mustache off First up, I want to talk about the Game Boy, because I think it acts as a great biome of all the ad types imaginable from the era. It's a nice appetizer, it's a warm-up act, if you will. Here's a pretty standard Game Boy ad from the era. They're showcasing that the Game Boy Pocket comes in a wide variety of colors. They have the rainbow options splashed out on the page here, with the nice touch of printing them in the magazine at actual product size, and a little description of prices and bundles. Very, very by-the-numbers advertising. Show off the product. Describe what it is, nothing fancy here. Now, how do we take this and beef it up for our target audience? Why, with a disgusting flesh wall of ill-proportioned, grotesquely colored, and oddly sexually inclined tongues, of course, there's all sorts of great options here. You've got the designated oral sex therapists for Big Bird, the Tin Man, Minnie Mouse, and the Green M&M, all next to a, by comparison, questionably healthy-looking specimen, and some unfortunate bastard whose entire mouth is being overtaken by strep throat with each passing second. I'm really not sure who thought the best way to represent the clear plastic Game Boy in this ad was with a photo of the next patient on the hospital's list of upcoming amputees, but it was probably the same person who thought a Game Boy ad's perfect inspiration was John Carpenter's The Thing. Okay, so let's take this same concept and make it less unexplainably horrific and more fun. Let's make an ad that raises a very important question. Why did I share my beard off to appear in a Game Boy advertisement? But even more importantly, what do these outrageous character heads have to do with the Game Boy? Absolutely fucking lutely nothing. It doesn't matter. Look at the yellow guy here. This sunshiny, smiling character is jovial enough to brighten my day just by existing. And you should be thanking me because I showed it to you. Fine, you don't want to choose a rad dude to hang out with? Well then how about a tough chick to bang out with? The Game Boy's provocative imagery wasn't just limited to the mid-90s. The advanced SP's launch in 2003 saw its fair share of naughty images, including an odd campaign in Europe that gave the device the slogan, For Men. Oh, you thought I was joking earlier when I pointed out that the entire video game industry ignored women for decades. 
This is a fucking Nintendo console, probably the most accessible video game company of all time, approving ads explicitly telling 50% of the population to go fuck itself. Life used to be real wacky before smartphones ruined everything, kids. And we can go way bigger than this, too. I am a man of harder extremes than just showing the choose your character select screen from the hit video game Have Sex With Women 99. Because it's one thing to liken your console to a thrill and the sack, but it's another to denote it as a way to ignore your deplorable prom date who's guilty of the crime of having a huge crush on you. Unhand me, disgusting wench! I care not for prom night, nor for getting to third base after. I'm too busy trouncing King K. Rool in Donkey Kong Land for my Game Boy Advanced SP edition. But if you somehow net a woman who knows that nothing gets between you and being an elite gamer, at least the Game Boy Advanced SP is portable enough to play in bed after a half-hearted boning session with the woman who does a better job of being your property than your partner. My brain is personally flooded with intense levels of dopamine post-orgasm, and I know I don't speak for myself when I say that all it ever makes me want to do is fire up my little backlit boy toy and land just one more bro super attack in Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga. Fuck sex. Give me just one more Fire Emblem the Sacred Stone support conversation. That's what really gets me off. Okay, maybe I'm being a bit too dismissive of this demographic. Perhaps the prom couple features an overly clingy girlfriend wrapping herself onto a normally supportive but desperately in need of a break boyfriend. And maybe that couple in bed, they could be fornicating in the missionary position with the lights on purely for the sake of procreation. And the husband's jailbroken Game Boy Advance is currently Googling good parenting techniques and discounts on baby cribs at the Bed Bath & Beyond. Now, it could be that there's a chance that it's going to be that, but I don't think it is because the next ad is someone's sex slave being chained to her post while her owner gallivants about the town getting Cora Beniki burrowed into his brain because Tetris is easily the highest priority in this situation. What I really, really love about this ad is that it still plays into the virgin angle of the target audience. At first glance, most of you probably think that this is a couple exploring the kinkier side of sex, and one half of that equation got distracted midway through because of his Game Boy. But I see it as this woman somehow locked herself into a proper fuckfest position, and her secret crush didn't even read the text that she sent to him saying to come plow her brains out, because nothing, and I mean nothing, beats the euphoria of using a line piece to get a full Tetris. And I've got evidence to support my conclusion. Keep it in your pants. What a simple double entendre. The penis joke here is more obvious than when I try to cheat and disguise myself to win a child beauty pageant. But think about what the slogan is literally saying. Don't bother pulling your dick out at any point, because no one's going to want you to whip that thing out. You're not getting laid tonight, buddy, or ever, because you're part of the Game Boy dogma now. Let's backpedal a bit, because I mentioned Donkey Kong Land, which is from the Donkey Kong Country series, which is like one of my favorites of all time, and I can't go the whole video without mentioning this ad for the game. Let's take a break from the mixed messages of somehow being a pathetic virgin with multiple girlfriends and talk about the Donkey Kong Land ad because it looks like this. If these aren't the coolest graphics, my name isn't Yawiga Kanawi. That's a joke, I, I guess. I, I mean, it is funny but for entirely unintended reasons. The main giggle I'm getting here is that all it took to get a laugh out of people 25 years ago was to completely forgo being clever in any way, and instead just point out, people in other cultures have different names than we do. That's fucking hilarious. Okay, fine. I understand that you don't want any of this dated stuff, and you've been glued to the screen because I hinted at a time-honored classic entertainment staple, the possibility of titties. Be forever melancholy that these gaming days are only from yesteryear because back in the day, your ad for your upcoming video game could literally be this. Now, you may not have noticed it, but this is an ad for a volleyball video game. Boy, look at those graphics and gameplay. Gracious of the advertisers to include about 30 pixels dedicated to showing them off out of the 1 million dedicated to these random hot no-bodies. And the funniest part, this ad actually ups the ante compared to the standards at the time. Ladies and gentlemen, I now proudly present my newest segment on my channel that I'm going to be putting in nearly every video I make, titled, Hot Women Next to Arcade Machines.
What's actually historically interesting about these specifically is that these aggressive assaults on the immediately post-pubescent didn't stop with the consumers. Arcade owners were advertised to to buy these machines in the same manner as the clientele. As delightful as that slideshow was, I want to call very special attention to my favorite of that bunch, Shark Attack. Now, we've got the industry flagship of finding someone with a juicy ass and having them stand next to a 300-pound box of electronics, but then, just to really drive the point home, we're told to thrust and munch. Now, thrust I get, but munch? There's a thousand and one slang terms out there for all things oral and sexy, but munch is either too specifically violent to make any sense, or it's going after the lesbian market, which is fairly off-putting in the same way that Cow and Chicken's lesbian episode was, which I'll link my review of in the description. It's absolutely missing the idea of marketing for men and men only. Bravo to you, Shark Attack, for bucking industry trends, staying true to your roots, and potentially being offensive in a whole new light in one complete vapid package. Now, I could make everyone in the audience happy and spend the rest of the video just posting pictures of hot women in video game advertisements. Now, I don't care if you're a straight woman, a gay man, or a big blowhard arguing about modern beauty standards. Everyone appreciates a beautiful woman, and you're absolutely lying if you say you don't. You can't fight your natural instinct you predictable human motherfucker. So I need to stop fighting my natural instinct and finally show you the cream of the crop of hot women in game advertisements so we can get off this topic and talk about something funnier. Behold! In case you didn't notice, there is a beautiful naked woman on this page. It's the ad so hot, it was highly controversial. God, I love how one note this culture is. You don't get laid because you're a gamer. And if it's not because gamers are inherently loser nerds, it's because you're just too in the zone with your games to care for the opportunity. But this ad went a wee bit too far in offending people, and not just because it's advertising the god-awful Sega Saturn. It's because... Well, fucking look at it. If you're blinder than Stevie Wonder and watching my video, somehow, let me go ahead and read a direct quote from former managing editor of GamePro, Mike Wiegand. GamePro being the video game magazine that this ad originally debuted in. This is probably the most controversial advertisement to ever run in GamePro, and it came straight from Sega's marketing department. Readers pelted the GamePro editors with hate mail and threatened to cancel their subscriptions when this two-page centerfold ran in 1996 promoting the Sega Saturn game system. We're talking about a time and culture that bathed itself in misogynistic gravy, and yet this one was so in your face, the general public that it appealed to threatened to bail. Damn, son, that's harsh. I still hold the theory it's because they were tricked into looking at the Sega Saturn for more than five seconds, which is a fate worse than death, but I could be wrong. Let's change speeds here a little bit. Now, one of the folders I talked about earlier I think acts as a very good palette cleanser. I titled that folder Actually Awesome Ads. They're ads from the time period that I found while gathering these images that may or may not suffer from the same problems of the era, but at the same time, they're pretty dang good ads. I used Stevie Wonder as my go-to sightless person for that joke earlier because I really want to talk about this wonderful ad. Stevie Wonder. If I could play video games, you bet it would be Atari. That's good. It's pretty fucked up, but it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad it's fake. See, this ad has been circling the internet for a while as a shock value piece to communicate to people that this edgy, wacky, zany, gamer humor craze started early, but it's not real. It's a photo taken from an actual Stevie Wonder ad for an effects pedal called the Mootron 3. And while this ad is fake, the fact that the majority of people who see it think it's completely real really, really speaks to old school gamer culture in my mind. If there's people on the internet thinking that this was the first shock value gaming advertisement of its time way back in the complete early days of video gaming? Imagine how much worse things got down the line. I think you need an example. Well, to be fair, I do actually owe you an ad that is a genuine palate cleanser and something I think is good. So here, 
take exactly what you expected me to talk about next. Rayman taking a piss at a urinal as random businessmen are shocked by the size of his enormous penis. Someone call this image Golden Corral cause this thing's one hell of a buffet. There's plenty to digest here, such as why Rayman of all franchises being the series where the huge features dick joke comes into play. You could also wonder that while it's sensical and funny that enormous whip out gargantuan and massive are all in capitals to add to the humor why is the word plunge in all capitals is the implication that rayman's dick is so long it falls into the urinal bowl and if that's the case that's shockingly elaborate and kind of gross for an ad of a kid's game but what i'm busy thinking about this whole time is how does Rayman's penis work? Is it attached to his body or does it float around like his hands and feet? If he whips it around too fast, will it make for an effective weapon to assault the office drones with thanks to its disconnectivity? And if that's true, why doesn't he do that in the games? It seems like a mighty underutilized gameplay mechanic and piece of character development going on here. No wait, I'm not done. If it is detached from his body, do they count like the, the floating space as part of the length? See, that part I really need to know, because if that's how they qualify him as having a Brobdignagian member, then I personally think it's cheating. And I think because this ad raises so many questions and just feels so out of place knowing the game series it's trying to promote, it is definitely squarely in the awesome ad category. Now that also quite nicely leads to one of my other categories. In my list earlier, I said a handful of the ads fell into the missing the mark category. It's quite simple. These are ads that outside of being possibly offensive or strange, completely and utterly misrepresent the game they're made for. Just think of these like the advertising versions of the Phalanx game box art. Game box art? That might be a good sequel video. But it'll only happen if you support me, you silly fucks, because I love money. Actually, that reminds me. I've recently been partnered with Gamersups, and I'm doing it for selfish reasons, because if I sell enough units, they'll produce a gamer energy drink based on my design and whatever I want and I really really want an energy drink named after me. If you click this video, you'll probably like hot anime women in video games anyway, so click the link in the description to support my channel directly and use code HUGBEES to get 10% off of pretty much anything. Anywho, now that my credibility's ruined, you know how in the West for the longest time Kirby was given angry eyebrows to make his games look more action-packed and exciting to a Western audience? Well, Earthbound was given the same treatment but in a much less flattering way. In fact, the treatment was so unflattering, a lot of fans theorize it's part of the reason the game totally bombed outside of Japan. Now, for some reason, perhaps caused by a loose boulder in the Nintendo marketing division that crushed the building's ceiling and killed off all the smart employees, Nintendo thought the best way to advertise Earthbound, which, reminder, is a quirky RPG about children with psychic powers, was through campaigns saying the game stinks. Literally. They took photos of the cute little clay models made by the Japanese advertising department and used their offbeat nature to convey that the game was yet another product of the lowball tier of 90s animation. Gross out, irreverent, and bizarre for the sake of being bizarre. Just read the opening line of this one and you'll see how much of a fuck up this was. Comes with more rude smells than the old pull my finger joke. You've never seen or smelled a role-playing game like this. Oh, and they even American curbified Ness to make him look older and more confident in the ads. Look at that backwards baseball cap. It really screams, I go to the gym three days a week so I can hit my girlfriend even harder. I mean, come on, Earthbound isn't fucking Booger Man or Earthworm Jim. This is an egregious mismatch of dumbass proportions. Just a real stupid decision. This is like giving Mario a tribal tattoo to show off how tough he is. It's a vacuous time capsule that's not gonna help sell anything and is only gonna hurt your customer base. Anyway, here's Mario with a tribal tattoo to help advertise the Game Boy Advanced SP Tribal Edition. Oh man, it's been a long time since I last saw Winamp skin as part of a list of gift package perks. The Tribal Edition did eventually run other ads like this one that I think is actually pretty solid, but I can in good consciousness give either of these ads passing marks because it's a fucking tribal tattoo. Come on, you know you agree. I mean, it's gross, right? 
Well, speaking of gross, check this shit out. What the fuck? Finally, baseball without the chili dog farts. The boys of summer, leaning in, taking their cuts, and blasting you out of the park with those long, foul floaters they get from stadium food. Hooey! Good thing there's Virtual League Baseball, TM, with big league pitching, slugging, and fielding in bigger than life 3D. You can choose from 18 world-class teams. So don't just sit there waiting to hurl, slide into the store and give it a crack. You can tell it's baseball season from the proverbial smell of shit in the air. This was such a bold, unapologetic time. I want you to sit down with me at a Denny's, order a Hobbit whole breakfast, despite the fact the last Hobbit movie was made in 2014, and tell me with a serious straight face that you could do this for any baseball game released within the last 10 years. Tell me with the confidence that Samwise Gamgee had when he said, there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for that this could ever happen again except in ironic parody. There is no way any major studio baseball game, or really any baseball game for that matter, would risk its profit margins in between the butt cheeks of an ass-ripping fat man. And that's real ironic, because this game was made for the Virtua Boy, so it was already a piece of shit. But the butts won't stop here, nor will the sports game world's obsession with flabby asses. Check this one out. Okay, Okay, so I've, I've had to censor this one because there's some real raw meat flaps going on behind the censor bar there. If it were up to me, the shared human experience that we all on Earth know as having a butt is something I wouldn't bother censoring because even the dumbest of kids know what a butt looks like. But be sure to spit all over YouTube's overprotective face for me as you feel secondhand embarrassment for the fact that this image that I'm not allowed to show you used to run in public consumer magazines aimed for teenagers and yet is too offensive for a website with a hundred 22 million daily visitors. I love all of you watching. I truly do. But this platform's fucking pathetic, man. Oh, oh, also this this guy's penis isn't hanging out. I'm just being overly cautious. I mean, it's the fourth time today a naked fat man pissed me off, so let's just move on. Hannah was wasted. Last night, she'd partied in four different time zones. Hannah's not wasted, she's dead. This chick found a way to synthesize heroin through an obvious Habbo Hotel ripoff. You know what, fuck it, I need a new game to play. Let's give it a go. Oh, okay, never mind. Turns out Virtual Zones rebranded sometime today into V Zones and is still around today. They've got a thriving community that's still going strong. Check out this five year old video I found on YouTube called V Zones Main Meat. Ooh, fuck yeah, that's some high octane V zoning if I've ever seen it. Let's check out the comments. This was less than 30 seconds. Your memory blows. If you're not wave dashing your way to the V zone sign up page by this point, then I don't know what you're really doing with your life, to be honest. Anyway, here's another weird mouth based ad from Nintendo. It looks like a middle schooler's project on. Uh, it looks like a middle schooler's project. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. Hang on a second. Hang on. Hang on. Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Hey, Emily? Emily. Yeah. Emily. Could you shut the fuck up, please? We're trying- everyone's trying to watch my video. We're trying to do something here. No one cares what TikTok you got on your phone that you're gonna show to everyone else, or any of this stupid, boring crap that you want to talk about. Everyone's trying to watch me on the screen right now. Okay, Emily? Just shut the fuck up a little bit. <sighs> Sorry about that. As I was saying, it looks like a middle schooler's project on... Now you know what, the moment's gone now. Thanks a lot, Emily, you stupid bit. Okay, let's play our own game to lighten the mood a little bit. The rules are very simple. I'm going to show you an ad, and it's your job to not think about 9-11. Ready? Go! Remember, as you buzz the 42nd floor of the Twin Towers. Sorry, you lose. Okay, let's try again with the lightning round. Ready? Three, two, one, go! Ah, dang, you lost again. And the worst part is that adds also for the Sega Saturn. Okay, quick, move on though. We need another palate cleanser because this video is just gonna be fucking deleted if I stay on this topic too long. Check out this radical dude. I can and should make an entire video dissecting the whole trope of extreme wacky guy fashion from the 90s because it is probably my favorite fashion style on the planet. If I weren't super lazy and just kind of threw together 
together my daily look, this is how I would dress every single day. But the funniest part of this ad is that Palamedes is a puzzle game that looks like this. Now I can easily put this one on the list of missing the mark, but I mean, come on, this bodacious dude is so tubular, I just couldn't do that to him. Oh, okay, I feel a little better now. I think there's a bit of a buffer, so now we can get back to the shock and awe. Let me introduce you to the Command and Conquer ads. Command and Conquer was a militaristically inclined real-time strategy game, and they did not give a f fuck when it came to their ads. They wanted this shit to sell and they relied entirely on a dropkick of visceral imagery to do it. Let's put the first one up on the board. Damn it, can we stop referencing that event for five minutes? Put another Command & Conquer one up on the screen. What the fuck? Jesus Christ, Command & Conquer. Okay. Okay, let's try... Let's try one more. Okay, you know what? Do me a favor. If I'm not gonna make any money off this project and YouTube's demonetization softblock algorithm is probably gonna tank the view count, why don't you go ahead and check out my gaming channel, Hugby's Gamer Mode. It's where I regularly post more casual content and it's a great way to get more stuff from me while I work on bigger videos like this one. So if you wanna hear more of my sultry voice, head on over there. Here, uh, here on the screen is the name of the channel, and I'll put a link in the description so you can watch it. And if you don't think it's worth your time, well, one, you're stupid, but two, here's a clip. Can I wave? What's the wave button? Uh, you can pull out your gun. Make it big. Okay, okay, another. Attention spans are only getting shorter and I've got shit to do. Oh, this is a classic we didn't really touch on yet. In addition to being openly misogynistic and blatantly nauseating, video game culture of this time period loved pulling out the old Ain't Japan Weird and Zany card. Tons of ads and gaming humor in general at the time was kind of just making fun of Japanese culture's unexplainable nature at a surface level. What the fuck does a quirky comedic game like panic have to do with a guy rocketing milk out of his nose? I have no idea, but its sole purpose was to parody a famous ad campaign from the era and liken it to an absurdist scenario that you would expect from a Japanese video game, and back then that's pretty much all you needed. Don't believe me? Let's go even harder. Mr. Takahiro is personally accountable for programming fun code. If you and your friends aren't completely freaked out with fun, then he will be fired. This will dishonor his family, which he can only restore by taking his own life with a sword. Oh, you know, just seppuku, the same way the samurai would off themselves to protect their family legacy. Because it's Japan! And everyone there does that because it's a Japanese thing! Speaking of first come, first serve stereotypical humor, check out this deep nostalgia hole that I fell into while I scrawled through this cesspool. I used to watch X-Play every single day after school growing up. Utilizing the fact that this ad thought the phrase sucks on fire was actual comedic gold, it should tell you everything you need to know about the caliber of content that was on display with X-Play. Go and watch some clips for yourself floating around YouTube if you want to know what most unfortunately probably shaped my sense of humor. Now what if we crank things out in the other direction? What if we acknowledged this swirling blender of juvenile antics and misanthropic entertainment and said, yeah, 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 let's do more of that shit. What if a company saw the landscape of all these ad campaigns and said, ah, oh, yeah, we can be even more shocking than that. What if we were Sega in the early 1990s? Bam! Oh, just look at them all. There's one about farting and one about dick jokes and all. Oh, there's just tons of fun to be had here. So so how in the fuck did Sega get away with throwing away any and all subtlety and just shoving masturbation right into the public's faces? Well, these ads came from a magazine called Viz, which is a British adult humor magazine that does basically the exact kind of thing you see in these ads here. Sega had a bit of an edgy reputation back in the 90s, and they were desperate to tell people that Nintendo was for nintoddlers and Sega was for real cool kids. These ads coming directly from Sega themselves is downright impressive and, as I've reiterated probably like a thousand times throughout this video now, something that would never happen again today. But in the context of only being shown in an adult humor magazine, it's actually the perfect addition 
attention to it. And while I'm already here, I may as well single out a few of them that particularly tickle my fancy. You've got this one that explicitly tells gamers to play with themselves and makes me question who operates a game console while naked at penis height. This hurts my neck. And I'm not getting naked, you're just gonna have to imagine a 14 inch penis with your mind. What's blue and pisses all over everything? Sega have taken delivery of Sonic the Hedgehog on all formats, Master System, Mega Drive, and Game Gear at all decent retailers now. All right, play the clip. I come to make an announcement. Shadow the Hedgehog's a bitch-ass motherfucker. He pissed on my fucking wife. Huh, it looks like Robotnik was mistaken. It wasn't Shadow that pissed on his wife. It was Sonic. And then there's this one, which is just another case of, wow, holy shit. But by far my favorite one is this last one, and I'm going to read it verbatim because I can't lie, it's pretty fucking awesome. The Sega Mega Drive has over 130 available games. With any other console, you're just going through the motions. With piles of shit hot games, many at a strainless 1999, the Sega Mega Drive dumps all other fiber free game systems. I want to wrap up this video with what I've dubbed the Big Three. These are three ads that, in my mind, are. You know what, fuck it, actually, let's real quick just make it four because I have to talk about this Mortal Kombat ad. For some reason, I saw this ad a ton on shocking video game advertisements of the 90s lists around the internet, and I have to ask, are you people fucking stupid? This ad is awesome. It's not shocking. Oh man, those men are gonna beat up those kids. Oh no. Oh, real guys coming out to threaten children. Ooh -wee. Oh no, I just Rick and Morty. It's also not lame like a lot of post retro websites have written about. It's a really clever ad that hypes you up for the game, especially if you know Mortal Kombat's lineage of using digitized actors. It fits the style of the product perfectly, and it's a fun idea. This is an excellent and most importantly memorable advertisement, and I need you to tell everyone who puts this on their top 10 most mild things that I'm gonna pretend are incredibly offensive because I'm a big pussy list that they're never going to be an influencer because their opinions are uninspired. Anywho, the top three. These are the three ads that I think fully utterly and completely encapsulate the era. We've got the holy triforce of the market down to a T with these three. Poorly aged childish humor, completely misrepresenting the game you're selling, and an ad that's actually incredibly clever and printed out a crisp 10 out of 10 showcase on how to get people's attentions for the standards of the time. First up, let's start with our poorly aged champion. If you don't play Duke Nukem 3D, you like men. If you don't play Duke Nukem 3D, you like men. Man, this one's made the rounds on the internet as a meme for a good fucking reason. Really breathe this one in, really smell the roses in the garden of never again. Out of everything we've covered here that paints a vivid picture of the intolerant irreverence of the 90s, we never touched on one specific thing from that era that's a pretty strong part of its identity, because it's a part that people tend to not discuss or want to talk about often. Do you like this top? so gay. Really? Yeah, it's totally gay. You know, you really shouldn't say that. <sighs> say what? Well, say that something's gay when you mean it's bad. It's insulting. Back in the 90s, people just called stuff gay as a casual insult. Now, of course, bigotry and hateful language have existed since the dawn of civilization, but let me put it this way. I grew up in the 90s, and I used to call stuff gay as an insult as a child all the time. Now, obviously, I don't do this anymore because it's pretty mean and stupid. And lately, the queer community and online language as a whole seem to have taken back the idea of this by calling things gay in a totally ironically insulting fashion. Besides, what are you gonna do? Cancel eight-year-old me? There's plenty of much more hateable eight-year-olds out there, trust me. But getting back on track, 
I personally lived through this time period, and let me tell ya, calling stuff gay back then, especially among young boys, aka the exact demographic that these ads target, was totally normal and casual. This ad says clear as day that if you don't play this game, you are gay. And if you are gay, that is a bad thing. That is mind-blowing when you think about it. It's one of the best examples of how things have changed for the better in the gaming industry. I am pretty fucking sick of everything trying to be a movie cinematic game, and boy am I tired of battle royales. But at least we're not insinuating that there's something wrong with being a man who enjoys a tasty penis every now and then. Ooh, okay. Next up, we'll tackle what I consider to be probably the best video game magazine ad of all time. Check this out. That is fucking flawless. No, it's seriously really, really good. It's a clever idea completely in line with the product. Make sure to include a blurb about what the product exactly is for people who don't know. And the best part is, it's completely accurate and true. Take whatever magazine you found this in and cut Paper Mario out of it. Congratulations, all you need now is some glue and you've got a fun little Paper Mario sticker in an era where getting this shit off the internet wasn't the most convenient thing on the planet. There's even a double whammy of this taking out the competition. Think about if there were another ad printed on the backside of this page and kids actually went ahead and cut the sticker out. You have just ruined a competing ad. Less is absolutely more. That's why when I want to talk about something, I spend almost an hour being as verbose and wordy about it as humanly possible. In an era of plastering sex, violence, misogyny, homophobia, and vulgarity everywhere, this ad managed to be memorable and effective without needing any of it. It's a masterclass in managing to do better than everyone else while being different from everyone else. A double A plus for Paper Mario. Well done. I wish I could stop here, but we have one more ad to talk about. And if you know anything, and I mean anything about magazine video game ads, you know exactly what's coming next. Behold, the most infamous video game ad, not just in video game magazine history, but in video game history. John Romero is about to make you his bitch. This ad is for Dai Katana, a massively hyped game of its time. John Romero, if you don't know, helped make a few important games like, I don't know, Quake, Wolfenstein 3D, fucking Doom. No, not that. Fucking Doom, just, just Doom. No, not that, okay, you get it. The history of John Romero, the rest of the team behind those shooters, and the birth of this incredibly infamous ad is a long, complex story that's good enough not just for its own separate video, but for an entire book. So in typical fashion of completely ripping off my best ideas, David Kushner wrote a book on this exact topic 20 years ago. I highly recommend reading his book, Masters of Doom. The book in question that I myself personally have read that's both a fun story-style retelling of the history of the world's most influential first-person shooter, as well as a great time capsule of gamer culture as viewed through a 2003 lens. Consider it the perfect supplemental info to my genius script here, and think hard about the last time you actually read a no-frills book without pictures in it. This is about where I would hold up my copy of the book, like a bunch of book-reviewing YouTubers usually do, but I don't have one because I read a digital copy because I'm not a fucking caveman. Let's try to compress this dense narrative in a way that leaves enough impact for why calling your audience a bitch is maybe a bad idea beyond face value. Id Software, the illustrious team John Romero was on that I mentioned earlier, was going through a real rocky road breakup after their release of Quake in 1996. John Romero left the company, or was fired, depending on who you asked, and pretty much literally said, Oh yeah? Well, I'll make my own software company with blackjack and hookers and a two million dollar office and you know what i'm john romero so i'm not exaggerating about any of that you thought i was going to reference futurama didn't you you predictable son of a bitch so here comes ion storm the new studio founded by john romero and some other former id software big boys including tom hall a game designer who had quit id software earlier and went on to work on duke nukem 3d kind of funny 
know, stuff comes full circle. This is relevant because Ion Storm from the outset was going to be huge. Possibly the most forward future thinking, flashy and impressive game studio ever for its time. Unfortunately, Ion Storm was so far ahead of itself that its brain finished three minutes before its ass did in an ultra marathon. When I mentioned $2 million office earlier, I was not kidding. The command post for Romero's post-id project was a gigantic penthouse office space on top of the Chase Tower in Dallas, Texas. This construction went into turning the studio into equal parts playhouse and publicity stunt. They adorned their lobby with a huge company logo etched right into the floor and had custom designed elevator doors. They garnished the studio with an entire dormitory of two bedroom sets, three full length couches, a widescreen TV which was expensive as fuck back in 1996, and most poorly aged and stupidest of all, two in-house telephone booths. They were also the first producers of pixels to embrace the work and play culture that a ton of gaming studios, hipstery tech startups, and out of touch office managers try to apply today. The break room had a ping pong table, a gaming area presumably loaded with consoles, and four arcade machines. Now this seems commonplace these days as businesses push harder and harder for us to trade our free time and humanity in exchange for quip dopamine hits and more dedication to the profits, but back then this actually served a functional purpose in a way. Romero had routinely worked in and even enjoyed hyper fixated crunch time environments. He'd casually pull all-nighter work schedules and actually encouraged it amongst his employees throughout his years. His motivations for this wasn't schedule mashing or employee exploitation, it actually came from genuine passion and obsession in making games, whether you see this as a positive or negative trait is up to you. And of course the industry these days, crunch time is a huge, huge debated issue on the ethics and the bad and good parts about it. But Romero got his startup spending days and days straight working on his projects purely because he was motivated to do so. To this end, they modified the bathrooms specifically to have showers and changing rooms. Romero wanted employees to feel like they could work on their games at all hours, and more importantly, wanted the public to perceive them that they were working on games at all hours. So you've got a flashy live-in office loaded with a large team of talented people, and it's finally time to get people hyped for the next big product, Die Katana. A game straight from the mind of one of the motherfuckers behind Doom! I seriously cannot stress to all of you Gen Alphas out there watching how bombastically important Doom was to the gaming industry. The advertising cabal behind Ion Storm's product line thought the best way to sell all of this was to tell you that all of this money, all of this talent, all of this innovation will culminate in just one thing! John Romero is about to make you his bitch. This game better be fucking good, and I mean real good, because if it's not, this is gonna be really embarrassing. Well, I'm happy to report Ion Storm did come out with an incredible game in the year 2000. A game so good it's still heralded today as one of the all-time greats. Spun off into a legion of sequels and has countless hours of discourse over the immense depth of its story and the philosophical meanings contained within. That game is Deus Ex. A game made by an entirely different branch of Ion Storm, completely unrelated to the Dai Katana team. Dai Katana released a month before Deus Ex did, and was a huge steaming pile of shit. So what happened? Well really, the question is, what didn't happen? You know that big old Technodrome office? Well those giant penthouse skylights and windows made programming on old school monitors a nightmare. Employees routinely had to lay black curtains and bed sheets over top of their cubicles just so they could see what the fuck they were even working on. And then there's the initial investment. Two million dollars poured into a game company that hadn't made a single game. Sure, the team was experienced and featured some industry superstars, but that really doesn't matter if they haven't proven their worth yet. Romero was interviewed in 2010 by Game Sauce, where they questioned him about the infamous advertisement. He explains why the ad was a terrible idea, better than I ever could, so I'm gonna go ahead and link the interview in the description. Romero said, quote, 
You know, I never wanted to make you my bitch. Not you, not them, not any of the other players, and most importantly, not any of my fans. Up until that ad, I felt I had a great relationship with the gamer and game development community, and that ad changed everything. That stupid ad. I regret it, and I apologize for it. I mean, there were really two products with Dai Katana, right? One was its marketing and hype, and the other was the game. You know, when that ad was first presented to me, I knew it was risky, and I didn't want to do it. It didn't make sense. While the game could have been better on a number of levels, that ad and the hype that preceded it and followed it was clearly a marketing failure and was followed by my failure to stop it. I should have said fucking no. Even if I'd come out with a brilliant game, it wouldn't have mattered. The ad insulted nearly everyone who read it. It was a terrible marketing decision. This ad is the worst game ad of all time for one specific reason. John Romero said the fuck word. But for another reason, despite being a failed product, despite directly insulting the target audience, and despite doing a poor job of informing and exciting new potential customers, the worst thing about the Dai Katana ad is that the man behind the entire thing didn't even want to make it in the first place, and now regrets having done so. Oh well, that doesn't mean I have to regret anything that I've done, nor does it mean that I have to stop. Maybe one day I'll cover more bad game ads. It'll completely depend on how much I feel like talking about this again. I mean, hell, we didn't even look at retro video game commercials. There's a ton of stuff to unpack there, and I even mentioned looking at game box art early in the video, which, if you think about it, that's another form of game advertising. Oh, and we can't forget about billboards and social media campaigns, and wow, there really is just a lot to talk about in the land of advertising in the most representationally confused hobby of all time. But for now, I've got to go teach robots how to love so I can teach them how to feel genuine pain. Bye bye